Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to have a webinar on um, understanding racial trauma and promoting resiliency. And we're so grateful to have um, the Radical Root Collective and members of our youth board here today uh, to be leading us through this. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and the supporting materials and slide deck will be shared after the webinar in a follow-up email. Uh, and for if you need higher quality audio, you can dial in the number that was um, sent to you in the invitation link. I also want to talk about the chat that the panelists will not be engaging in the chat during the webinar. Um, we will have a time for Q&A at the end. At that time, questions will be answered. If you share questions throughout, I'll be tracking them and uh, can follow up with the panelists at the end. If there are any tech issues, I will do my best to answer them um, during the the webinar and um, and just to be clear, the panelists will be um, responding at the end during the Q&A section and I will um, be responding during um, to the best of my ability and tracking the questions for the end. Uh, the webinar today is put on by the California School-Based Health Alliance. We um, believe in improving the health and academic success of children by advancing health services in schools. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can go to our website. And we have a conference coming up in April. It's going to be at the University of Redlands. It's going to be in person uh, on April 29th. If you'd like to um, register, um, it's on our website. We'd love to see you there. And um, if you want to become a member, here's the link to the membership. That's how we um, put on webinars and trainings like today. And, and with that, I am going to pass it on to Radical Root. Hello everyone, uh, welcome. Thank you all for being here with us today. And thank you CSHA for um, the brief introduction and for hosting this webinar today. So we're just gonna start off with brief introduction from all of our panelists um, today. And so good morning, my name is Andrea Gutierrez. I am a third year youth board member with California School-Based Health Alliance with CSHA. I am also a student at California State University Northridge. I am a senior majoring in public health and minoring in human lactation. Um, I am pursuing a career as a certified nurse midwife. And I'd also like to share that um, I do use she, her pronouns and I identify as Chicana. And I'll hand over to Nidia to introduce herself. Thank you, Andrea. My name is Nidia Hernandez. Uh, I identify as a proud Latina. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, this is my second year on the youth board at CSHA and I am a full-time uh, family coach and mother of two beautiful baby girls. And, um, I will hand it over to Joe. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Joe Brownson and I use she, her pronouns. I identify as white and I'm the co-director of Radical Root Collective and also a, uh, a partnership project lead with CSHA and our organizational partnership with them as well. And I will pass it over to Amelia. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Amelia Ortega and I'm located on the East Coast right now. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a trauma therapist, and I run a practice out of New York City. I'm really excited to be here today and I identify as um, Chicana, Chicanex, and multiracial. I'm gonna pass it to Tequila. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Tequila Washington. I use she, her pronouns. I identify as black slash African American and I use those terms interchangeably for myself. I'm the co-director of Radical Root Collective with Joe and I am a licensed clinical social worker. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm gonna hand it back over to Andrea. So after today's webinar, um, you'll be able to identify and describe racial trauma. We're going to go into different forms of racial trauma and some examples. We will also be exploring symptoms associated with racial trauma at the individual and community level. And something I'm super excited for you all to experience, um, some embodiment exercises that can be used to foster healing, promote resiliency within yourselves and those that you serve. And I'll pass it off to Tequila. 
or some grounding questions? Whenever we conduct trainings, webinars, workshops, we like to offer questions to the audience that help you to ground into the content that we're going to be providing. We have two grounding questions that we'd like to offer for today. The first grounding question is, what is racial trauma and how does it impact me and the skin that I live in? The second grounding question is, what can I do to contribute to our collective healing? So we want you just to kind of sit with these questions and be reflecting on them as we go throughout the content for today. In terms of our flow for the day, we are now in our opening section. We're going to start off in a moment by actually inviting you into a grounding embodiment exercise. For our rooting and growing section, that's where we're going to get into the meat of our content. We're going to provide an overview of what is trauma, and then we're going to really hone in on what is racial trauma? What are some of the causes of racial trauma? And from there, we're then going to then move into looking at what does healing mean within the context of hate, racial trauma? What is racial healing? What does that look like individually? What does that look like collectively? We'll then have a designated time for Q&A, and we'll end with a closing. We want to invite you to make sure that you have um, a journal, a notebook, or a paper that you can write with throughout our time together today. There's going to be moments where we're going to be inviting you to pause and reflect. And so if you have that material available, that'll allow you um, to be able to jot down thoughts when we um, designate those times throughout our time today. In addition to inviting you to do written reflection, we're also going to be inviting you to do um, embodiment exercises throughout our time today. We wanted to start off by just talking a little bit about what is embodiment and why does it matter? Why are we actually introducing this concept within the context of a racial trauma seminar? So embodiment really is an invitation. Embodiment is an invitation for you to not only tap into your mind, your brain, your thoughts, but it's an invitation to remember that you also have a body. And not only do you also have a body, but your body is filled with wisdom. Your body is filled with wisdom that you can tap into as a source for yourself in your own healing within the context of trauma, within the context of racial trauma. Oftentimes in our society, we become really disconnected from our bodies as a form of survival. And so through our time today, we really want to invite us to be tapping into and really experiencing the sensations, the feelings that might be coming up in our bodies, becoming really curious about that, really taking the time to slow down and tap into that energy, because we really believe that this form of um, healing can be really um, important for us in our own journey. And so you're going to be noticing us mentioning this, and you're going to be noticing us pausing to invite you into embodiment exercises throughout. To get us started, I'm going to be handing us over to Nydia, who's going to lead us in our first embodiment grounding exercise. Thank you, Tequila. Um, so as Tequila was saying, you know, we really want to ground ourselves and really just um, you know, remind ourselves where we're actually planted and where are we feeling these sensations. Um, so you may be entering this space with either a lot on your mind. Um, so again, we want to invite you to do this embodiment and practice with us, um, again, to really ground yourself into this space. So um, in counts of eights, I'd like you to move your arms in a way that feels good to you, whether that's stretching them out this way, stretching them out up, um, whatever feels good to you in counts of eight. So I'm going to count to eight, and then we're going to switch from our arms to our feet or legs. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So again, now we're going to move to our legs and really feel where your feet are planted. Feel whether even if you know you're at home, um, like a lot of us are right now or if, even if you're outside in an office, feel where your feet are planted. And again, really ground yourself and um, move your legs or move your feet in a way that feels good to you. Again, in counts of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
six, seven, eight. Alrighty, well, thank you all for doing that with us. And I'd like to pass it over to Joan and Amelia with their next slide. Thank you, Nydia. I wanna invite you to carry the energy forward and the resource forward. So if you need to move, um, please do that. Take care of your body throughout the content that we're sharing. So we're gonna start broad and then get specific. And we know that trauma is one of those concepts that is very nuanced. And a lot of folks have different ways of engaging in the concept of trauma, depending on what sector you work in, what your background is. Today, we want to sort of level set on what radical root defines as trauma and how we talk about trauma, because we think it's really important to pay attention to how we talk about trauma, particularly under systems of oppression, because how we talk about trauma can lead to how we respond to traumatized behaviors. It can lead to how we actually intervene in trauma. So we define trauma as our body's pretty miraculous response to some set of conditions, experiences, circumstances that the body experiences as too much, too fast, or too soon. And this definition is borrowed from Resma Menakam's work on racial trauma specifically. And we wanna really emphasize in this definition that trauma and the response that our bodies have is not a flaw or a weakness. And this is where it's really important in how we talk about trauma. Because as a teacher, former teacher myself, we tended to talk about the experiences of trauma of our young people in a way that pathologized them and further marginalized them, rather than really seeing our, their body's response as, a, as kind of a miraculous um, tool of safety and survival that comes also with a set of uh, practices that what they can tap into to actually survive through the trauma and heal from the trauma. So we want to underscore that it's not a flaw or a weakness as a way to kind of depathologize the idea of it, because when we talk about it as something that is a pathology, we end up pathologizing the person and not actually the set of circumstances or the system or the actions that produces the trauma response in our body. The other thing that's important to know that's embedded in this definition of trauma for us is that once that response becomes embedded in our body, once we have a reaction that our body is unsafe, right, that can become embedded in our body if we are not tending to it and moving through a process of healing. And that can get passed down intergenerationally. It can also um, become decontextualized, meaning that we have a trauma response in our body, whether or not our body is actually unsafe, because our body is no longer responding within the current concept of time or space, et cetera. So it's important to know that the perception of the unsafeness that our body's telling us might be accurate, it might be inaccurate, it might be entirely imaginary because it's actually rooted in an experience we had in the past, okay? So we want you to hold that as we, um, creates a little bit more specificity around what trauma is and the causes of trauma. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about racial trauma specifically. And I'll pass it over to Amelia. Great, thanks Joe. So we also wanna clarify that trauma is both discrete, meaning a single event. So we can experience what we call capital T traumas. Those are um, large scale events in our lives that many of us have had, such as a near death experience or a car accident, witnessing something really traumatizing and it happens one time. Um, trauma is also complex. So if you've heard of complex PTSD, it's a term we're hearing a lot more about now, especially in year three of a pandemic that we can understand that trauma is also really complex in the body that when we've lived a really full and big life, and been in community, we have multiple experiences throughout our life course, including in our family, in our in our job places, right, in all the environments that we live in. And that includes ongoing and chronic traumatic exposure as well. Um, here we've listed relational traumas because we are going to speak later on um, to some specific types of racial trauma that live in the relationships that we have. So to further illuminate that, we want to talk about different kinds of trauma, right? So we are talking here about three different 
particular types of trauma as they relate to the medical system today and thinking about young people's lives. So trauma is historical, right? Those are the conditions of our historical lives, our ancestors that we carry with us, the things that have happened and the ways that our people have survived, right? So our trauma response systems have worked because we're all still here. We've survived the lineages that we carry with us. And trauma is also systemic, right? It's all those systemic inequities that we are very aware of, especially in a school system or school environment that result in those chronic traumatic impacts on the day-to-day -day basis. And trauma is also developmental. So we can look at thinking about trauma in the body through a developmental lens. And that's when we really look at our relationships with caregivers and peers and communities um, and the ways that we've probably all had interruptions in what we would hope for to be the best possible um, conditions for our brain and our body developing. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Joe. So today's focus is on a particular form of trauma that again, we wanna zoom out to pathologizing, to understanding the causes of the trauma response that gets embedded in our bodies that we define as racialized trauma. To do that, we wanna, again, define another term for us that sometimes can be have associations with it that both are included in what we mean, but also are not included in what we mean. And so when we share definitions, we're really interested in having shared meaning with those that we're in relationship with. On the next slide, I'm gonna be showing you our definition of white supremacy. White supremacy is a term that we use to describe this, ideo this ideology, but also the system that we're talking about today that causes a racial trauma response in our bodies, regardless of the skin that we live in. As I read the definition, I wanna invite you to turn to your journal. And I want to, again, invite you to remind you that you have a body, that the words that you are about to see may cause a response in your body. So I wanna invite you to, as you listen to the definition, I'll read it twice, track in your notebook any sensations, memories, feelings that get activated by any of the words in the definition. And you can feel free to track the words that cause those sensations for you. So what does RRC mean when we say white supremacy? We define white supremacy as both an ideology and a historical and current system of trauma that shapes our perception of what is real. It moves through our individual and collective bodies as an energy intent on maintaining unequal power relationships. So first just sit with those words. Notice what comes up in your nervous system and feel free to jot down any of the thoughts, sensations, memories that arise for you. And I'm gonna read it one more time. White supremacy is both an ideology and a historical and current system of trauma that shapes our perception of what is real. It moves through our individual and collective bodies as an energy intent on man maintaining unequal power relationships. So what's important for us that you take away from this definition as we move into defining racial trauma is that white supremacy is a force that impacts each and every one of our lives because of the historical and current set of relationships and systems that have been created on this land that we now call the United States. And so this is the system that we want to be critiquing. This is the system that we want to be engaged in dismantling at multiple levels. Today, we're really talking about how does this energy that maintains unequal power relationships impact me and the skin that I'm in and impact the sets of relationships that I am um, interdependently engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis in my school, in my work, in the context of my family system. This quote by James Baldwin really anchors us in our definition of racial trauma, which is this idea that history is the present, right? When we talked about the definition of trauma, because white supremacy has a legacy and a current energy of violence and of um, maintaining these unequal power relationships of exploitation, 
we can't, um, it's, as James Weldon would say, it's criminal to believe that that history, that legacy, that ongoing violence doesn't impact each of us, right? So racial trauma is our body's response, protective response to being exposed to race-based stress, violence, erasure, and gaslighting. That is endemic, meaning it's part of life, right? It's part of being um, on this land we now call the United States because our nation was founded on um, settler colonialism and white supremacy. Right? So it is endemic. It's part of being alive and part of being living here now on this land. So with that, I just want to highlight um, two things before I pass it over to thinking about the causes and more specifics of how our traumas racialized in our um, culture and institutions. And one thing I just want to name is each of us, and so as a white person, I want to, I want to kind of decenter this idea that racial trauma doesn't impact us, that it only benefits us. And so we're going to talk a lot more about this. And I want to highlight that each of us in the bodies that we're in are exposed to the violence, whether we are perpetuators and beneficiaries of it materially, or whether we're targets of it, right? And so I want to folks to hold that, particularly folks in the in the um, audience, I guess we'll say at a webinar, <laughs> particularly in the training, who identify as white, right? We have a stake in this. We have a stake in unlearning this and in understanding our own traumatized response inside of racialized interactions in our relationships. And I'll pass it over to Amelia to get even more specific. And so I would like to introduce a couple terms that I think are useful in giving us a bit of a frame for understanding when we're saying that this lives in our bodies and we're saying that it's endemic, that to be here alive um, and living on this stolen land means that we have in some way been involved in an institutionalization or a systemic form of oppression that's racialized. And we can understand that through a lens of what we call institutional trauma and also thinking about another term, which is cultural betrayal trauma. So for BIPOC communities, and I, I want to speak to the mixed folks who might be in the audience or multiracial folks in particular, that um, for a lot of multiracial folks, we live between two or sort of, I always say, belong everywhere, belong nowhere. We know really well um, how sometimes we can benefit from those systems and then also be very marginalized by those very same systems. So coming out of a lot of understanding of the psychology of racism is this concept of really being betrayed culturally. So joining cultural groups or um, an example might be um, going to a provider, going to a doctor who shares the same um, racial identity or ethnic identity as you and feeling that that provider is actually not understanding um, how racism has impacted your body or that that provider is more aligned with an institution's agenda than with your health and well-being. So we can understand this very nuanced form of trauma that a lot of BIPOC bodies take in, which is not feeling safe even within institutions that are saying publicly or making um, public claims to be aligned with um, a community agenda. And so we experience those harms in a variety of different ways. Um, and I wonder if we could look at the next slide. So I'll speak to that. And so, um, you know, here we have the example again of being harmed by a doctor, um, also thinking about women of color um, and expressing pain and really having that pain invalidated. We have ample evidence of that happening all the time within our medical system. Um, Black women in particular have much higher rates of being invalidated and minimized when they seek care and express pain in their bodies. Um, and institutionally and culturally, this may land that we feel really um, invisibilized sometimes by our own people who have gone into professions or have gone into institutional um, work that have also, you know, their living legacy of the harm is that they may not be able to align um, with you as a patient. So we want to look at this from a couple of, of these lenses as well when we talk about racial trauma in the medical system. And so I'm going to pass that on now um, to Nydia, who's going to speak a little bit more to that. Thank you, Amelia. Um, and again, like John and Amelia were saying, to keep in mind when thinking through these institutions and understanding that these institutions 
institutions are rooted in white supremacy and rooted in capitalism. <clears throat> so um, here are some ways that some uh, medical service can be harmful or traumatizing um, specifically for the BIPOC community. And again, um, this is coming from my personal experience being um, a Latina, being, you know, first gen. Um, so, you know, really just keeping that in mind. Um, so one way, of course, of present that can be harmful is being rejected and disregarded um, from these medical offices um, and their services, uh, especially, you know, with visiting new offices, like for me, um, I've always had like, this rising anxiety that um, we would need to go to another office because um, we either didn't qualify or a temporary medical expired or simply because there was no translator um, that was able to help uh, my parents um, and me growing up. Uh, so now that I am an adult, uh, I still get that rising anxiety. Um, even though, you know, I know that I have medical insurance, I know that I'm able to pay the copay or pay whatever, um, because, you know, just seeing that firsthand and, and being turned away from, um, again, like Amelia was saying, you know, doctors that share the same ethnic background as me, um, seeing that as um, anxiety ridden and, and, you know, really just uh, keeping that always in the back of my head now that I am an adult. Um, and... Another question I'd like to open up is, you know, where where do we see this in the community? Um, so we see this a lot with like agriculture workers. Um, again, from my own experience, um, my parents are agriculture workers and with harsh working conditions and little to no medical insurance, um, they face this trauma every day. And um, we also see this in low income neighborhoods. Um, I myself am, am living in a low income neighborhood and um, these houses are usually built um, so close to factories and railroads that lead um, to many families um, ending up with like asthma or other um, illnesses. And not only does the environment outside their homes contribute to these illnesses, but the inside as well, such as, um, you know, lack of clean water, or even water damage um, leading to mold. Um, and on top, again, so I mean to feel, so on top of like the medical system being traumatic to the BIPOC community, um, it's also very traumatic uh, in our educational system. And I'd like to hand it over to Andrea with a little bit more insight on the education. Thank you, Nydia. And so another example of you know, institutional trauma and cultural betrayal is within our school, um, where students are experiencing uh, school trauma. And uh, one of the ways that we see this is through uh, the school to prison pipeline. So we're seeing at a national level, students being funneled um, from our classrooms, from their schools into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And this is happening at such an alarming rate. Um, and this is enforced by policies and practices like zero tolerance policies, increase of school resource officers or SROs for short. And so just to give an example, uh, the zero tolerance policy um, may allow a student to be handcuffed and detained for writing on a desk with an erasable marker. And it, it wouldn't matter what the circumstance was. It wouldn't matter, you know, history if this student had never received any, um, like detention, had never been in trouble, um, the zero tolerance policy would still allow for the student to be detained. Uh, and extreme cases like these are, are actually not rare. We're seeing students expelled and arrested um, and suspended for minor discipl disciplinary infractions. Um, and I like to pose the question of, you know, do these occurrences pose an immediate threat that would call for that kind of violence? Um, and again, if these policies and practices are in the name of education, then why is there such a vast difference in the expenditure? Um, and so I'd like to share that. Um, the cost of a year in a youth prison is $225,000, whereas our uh, expenditure for uh, education is under $8,000. So again, $225,000 compared to $8,000. And so if these policies and practices are, are in the name of education, then why is there such a vast difference, $225,000 and less than $8,000? Um, and unfortunately, SROs are actually feeding the pipeline and not preventing it. And so we're seeing harsh punishments, um, again, regardless of um, circumstance, regardless of history. And this disproportionately affects minority groups, our youth of color, um, multiracial youth. Uh, and uh, society is not free of stereotypes, prejudice, uh, racial inequalities. And so 
our youth of color actually do not engage in more delinquent acts, and yet our um, Black boys are three times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. Um, Black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. That, that also is such a big difference, right? If they are not engaging in more delinquent acts, then why are they three times, six times more likely to be suspended than their peers? Um, I'd like to also emphasize that African-American youth are 3.5 times more likely to be suspended or expelled. Uh, so unfortunately, many of our youth are uh, start their, you know, start their youth on a path to delinquency. And so students are really deprived of their fundamental right to an education. And I like to share a story from a youth um, by the name of Sana, who, when he was a junior, a uh, white student repeatedly called him the N-word as he was sitting in the library. And he uh, shares that he yelled back and he ended up in a headlock um, on the floor. And he recalls having um, five other peers, uh, white students, laughing at him. And so he describes feeling suffocated in his school. And although those students were reprimanded, that situation, that incident, you know, followed him throughout all of high school, even after he graduated. And it wasn't until he was in college during sophomore year where he reclaimed his love for music, for making music, and he finally kind of felt free to be himself. Um, and this happened in, in an elite private high school. So um, trauma from incidents like this remains. Um, students end up feeling like they don't belong and they feel that they have to now navigate who they are as a person of color within the schools. Um, and a lot of students experience microaggressions, you know, micro insults, um, micro invalidations. So like being called, you know, the N word in your school or being told that you couldn't have possibly written this paper because, you know, you're not well enough educated to have done that. And so these are just some examples of microaggressions. And um, alternatively, um, trauma-informed schools enhance emotional learning, school safety, and positive behavior interventions. Um, so that is just another example of institutional trauma and cultural trail. And if I could get the next slide, please. And so we're just gonna take a, a minute of reflection so if you can pull out your journals again and just jot down whatever thoughts, feelings, sensations come up for you as you hear these examples, as, you, as you've heard these definitions, um, whatever comes to mind, just let that flow onto paper. And we're just gonna take a brief moment to let you do your reflection. And we're gonna go ahead and slowly come back into this space and I'll go ahead and pass it off to Joe. Thank you, Andrea. So we've taken you through the, what are we facing? What are we experiencing? And um, heard some incredibly powerful examples of how institutional and cultural betrayal produces racialized trauma and racialized trauma responses 
inside of the human bodies that exist within these systems, right? Systems and policies and practices are really the products of our interactions. And so we at Radical Root want us both to be clear about how the status quo and oppression continues to be reproduced through our interactions and also spend energy and time imagining what is healing and recovery actually look like? How can we take the influence and power that we have back into our origin, into our bodies and use that to transform those interactions and by transforming those interactions, transform the policies, practices, and systems. So the next definition we're gonna offer is our racial healing definition that is a response to the energy of white supremacy, a response to our individual, it's an individual call to action of um, engaging in our own healing for that transformation. So I'm gonna read the definition again, like I did with the definition of white supremacy, and then we're each gonna share our individual narratives of how we have journeyed along a path of racial healing in our own personal and, um, and professional and multifaceted lives. We believe racial healing is an intensely personal and collective practice involving the recovery of a sense of wholeness and belonging that has been stolen, obscured, or co-opted by the system of white supremacy. Racial healing is an intensely personal and collective practice involving the recovery of a sense of wholeness and belonging that has been stolen, obscured, or co-opted by the system of white supremacy. So again, I just wanna invite you to take a deep breath, breathe in that definition, and I'm gonna take the slides down and we're going to each share um, our own personal narrative. We just invite you to listen and find connection and thread and pieces to that to each of our stories as we root into this definition for ourselves. And I'll pass it to Nidia to kick us off. Thank you, Joe, with that definition. Um, we talk about this sense of wholeness and um, you know how that ties into like healing um, and how you know you practice healing in such a white, um, you know, systematic environment or, you know, an environment that is very rooted in white supremacy. Um, and for me personally, I practice healing by just nurturing my inner child and letting her know, um, I'm really understanding that like nothing is or was my fault. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't get that care because I wasn't worthy of care in the medical field. It was, you know, simply because it, you know, that institution is rooted and white supremacy and because you know I was born brown and so you know I really just um nurture my inner child and let her under let her know that and understand that and um you know and with this I also practice um affirmations and even spiritual and cultural practices um that allow me to really dive deep into uh what my body my mind and my soul needs for its next healing phase um since you know for me healing um is a journey that really has no limits um, and you're going through healing every single day and, and you're going through just your next phase of healing. Um, and I'd like to pass it over to Amelia to, for her input. Thanks so much. I was smiling as you were talking, just loving the thought of little you getting to do all that powerful work. Um, so I'm Amelia and um, there's so much to say, but I, I want to start off by saying that I was born and raised here on Narragansett land in southern Rhode Island, um, two hours from uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts, where the first 13 original colonies were, and also two miles from the Great Swamp, which is this really beautiful land here that's Narragansett land, um, where one of the largest massacres happened. And my father immigrated here um, when he was a child. and. I have a white mom and a Mexican dad. And so I grew up with a really complicated idea of what it means to be both Chicana, Chicanx, and also multiracial on this land here in sort of the seat of where the original colonies were. Uh, and that history is embedded in the houses, in the stone walls, in everything that you can see that's literally built by hands here. Um, and so a part of my healing journey has been around 
reclaiming wholeness through learning that there are parts of both of my family's lineages that are worth learning about. Um, I grew up only with my Mexican family here, which is another complication. And so the message I got from an early age is that there is no value in um, understanding culture within whiteness, that my mother's family didn't have anything to offer our family. And so my journey has really been about learning more about whiteness and its operation in my family's history, and also reclaiming language on both sides. So really learning how to talk about having a, a white parent and also learning Spanish and being able to talk about the reclamation of language and language loss, which is a huge part for many um, second and third generation um, Latinx folks. So um, this is a long journey and I've found the most support in being with other multiracial folks who are interested in talking about grief and loss and what it means to reclaim and to get to really be whole internally when we show up in spaces around racial justice, that we don't have to show up fragmented. And that makes me a better ally when it comes to being an institutionalized ally, working as a social worker and working as a mental health provider. Yeah, so I think that's where I'll close and I'm gonna pass it to Joe. Thank you, Amelia. I a beautiful um, setup for the journey that I want to share, which is as a white person, my my people haven't always been white, and I and part of my journey in the education system as a young white child was the obscuring of that the atrocities of my people, but also an obscuring of the resistance, that part of it is an intentional erasing of the methodology of colonialism that actually was in practice for my people come from Scotland and France and Ireland, which early on, way before that discoverer, Columbus, came here, there was acts of rooting out indigenous practices, rooting out peasantry in sort of the same practices that were then carried over here. And for me, part of that recovery that I have tapped into that's helped in my own racial healing is to be both courageous to face how my people came here from Europe and participated in the system of land theft. I have a my maternal grandmother's side comes from upstate New York, where they pushed out the Iroquois, pushed out the um, Penobscot Indians in Maine, where we participated in settler colonialism there. And then I have another line that did a similar passage through the South. So part of reclaiming wholeness is claiming the whole of it, right? Facing, facing the pain and the violence that still is carried in my body and seeing the ways that that manifests in my, um, in my lifetime. And so, for example, my mother, I have a very early memory, memories of my mother, who's white, who would, we'd be in the car and she would get pulled over by an officer and she would start crying. And then she would immediately stop crying after he let her off a ticket usually, or they let, let her off the ticket. And I'd be like, mom, why are you crying? And it was a very intentional way that she was communicating to me a little bit about what it meant to be white. And I think about the statistics that Andrea shared earlier about the ways that as white people, we are taught to call the system to protect us when we are faced with accountability, with responsibility. And that is rooted in a sort of our own giving up of belonging to practices and cultural ways of being that were more earth-based, more rooted in community, more rooted in things that are deeply human. And so for me, it's about recovering a sense of knowledge about both the resistance and the atrocities that my, that folk, my people committed in, in my name, right, to produce me, the whole of that. And then also taking the responsibility for the ripple effects of that in my lifetime. So how do I recognize my own racialized response to my instinct to manipulate the power to protect me from hard feelings, to protect me from feeling all of the things that it means to be human? And also it means like concrete redistribution of the wealth and, um, and resources that I have unearned. And it means redistributing my income. My wife and I 
redistribute 10% of our income to frontline impacted organizations and people because not as like a, not as charity, but actually as a spiritual healing practice that is settling the score. It is settling our debts. It is settling our spirits and our ancestor spirits to say, this is how we are um, committed to taking responsibility for the wholeness of our story. And with that, um, I will pass the storytelling on to Tequila. Thank you. So for myself, um, when I think about the ways in which I've been impacted by the system and ideology of white supremacy, it lands really deeply in my spirit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I identify as Black slash African American. Um, I have ancestry that roots back to chattel slavery here in the United States that then goes back to Africa, a history that I I'm so disconnected from. As a little girl growing up here in what is now known as the United States, there are countless ways in which I internalize messages about who I was. I internalize messages about um, how othered I was, about how um, I was taught that I wasn't um, pretty enough. I was taught that I um, wasn't smart enough. I was taught like all, all of the not enoughs, right? I was taught in both subtle and not subtle ways. And I not only was I taught, but I internalized those messages. And so that it really altered the way that I felt about myself. Um, and that was a normalized experience for me. And it wasn't until I actually had the privilege of going on to higher education and going to college and I started to take ethnic studies classes, I started to take African American studies classes, sociology classes, that my mind started to open up to the all of the ways in which I had internalized all of these messages that were actually lies about who I was and who my people were. And so my path of healing, my path of recovery has been about re learning or re-tapping back into this sense of wholeness that is has actually always been within me, but I was so disconnected from. I like to talk about healing as like the ing right as the action as the ongoing process because i don't know if it's going to ever get to the point where i'm healed through this system because i'm constantly still receiving those messages and so my healing journey is a, a deeply kind of spiritual practice for me where i'm constantly rooting back and tapping into this internal sense of wholeness that is there that is part of my ancestry part of my family system. I try to intentionally have community and be in community with people that look like me, that people have similar values and reflections of the world as I do as a way of affirming who I am. Um, and there's other pieces to my healing journey, but I think those are the pieces that I want to name in particular, just re-highlighting that even with where I'm at in life now, it's still something that I have to actively daily navigate and really work on in terms of rooting myself in my wholeness so that I don't get lost in the ways in which society is trying to fragment who I am. And with that, I'll hand it over to Andrea. Thank you, Tequila. Um, so for me personally, for my healing journey, I'd like to share just the memory that comes to mind for me. Um, so I recall being in a room full of white adults and um, these are adults that I should have felt, I think, safe with. I, I should have felt okay sharing who I was. And we did introductions similar to how we did today, you know, our name, our pronouns and how we identify. And I remember I, I was not the first to introduce myself. And I remember as others were introducing them, themselves, I was contemplating what I was going to share. Um, and I ended up lying and I said uh, that I identify as white when I, I in fact do not identify as Chicana. And I think I felt that my ideas, my opinions would have been dismissed had I said what I really identify as. And again, this was in a room full of adults that I should not have felt that way with, but I just had internalized all these messages and I felt 
this fear as a young person, as a Chicana, a non-white individual, that I would not have been heard had I been honest. But, you know, after the meeting, I, I felt ashamed and I, I was almost in disbelief. Like, why, why did I say that? Why did I just do that? Um, and so now, like today and from then on, I have I have not lied. I am always honest. And I even will say that I am a proud Chicana when I come into a meeting and introduce myself. Um, and so for, for me, I, I, again, the emphasis on adults um, was because it can be scary and intimidating as a young person. I think of it as like this like paper crumbling where like I'm youth, I'm a woman, um, I don't identify as white. And this paper just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as I keep, you know, thinking about myself and how I see myself and how I, I portray myself. And so I end up feeling like this little crumbled piece of paper where it's so scary. And I always have to kind of remind myself that I should never feel that way, whether, you know, I'm in a room full of white adults, whoever I'm with, colleagues, peers, um, like I should, I should never lie and I should never have to feel that way. And I also recall being, um, once I, I, I really love teaching and I got into uh, this meeting in a room full of teachers and the, I was one of two students in the meeting. And I remember we were going through pros and cons of charter schools and I brought up this term as, uh, as one of the pros and I did not fully understand what that meant. And so I didn't realize that I actually see it as a con. And I remember having a teacher roll her eyes at me. She was sitting across from me. And because I named it as, as a pro instead of a con, um, instead of you know, asking me if I understood what the term was or if you know why I felt that way, she just rolled her eyes at me. And I remember thinking, like, I never want to come back to one of these meetings. Um, but for me, it's kind of been that pushback where like I won't let myself feel that way, feel small, feel intimidated, feel scared. Um, and I think now, I think as an adult now, I think of my experiences, what I went through, and I don't want other youth to go through that. And so I think, you know, if a youth were to now do what I had done, um, you know, I would, you know, I would ask those questions, I would have those conversations, instead of shutting them down, instead of rolling my eyes, um, or having them now experience something like I did. Um, and so I think I'll end my, my story with that and I will pass back to Amelia. Just taking a deep breath. <laughs> Maybe other folks are too. So a lot in all of our stories when we, when, you know, as I'm sitting here holding them together. Um, and, you know, I think for everyone out there listening, um, these are vulnerable stories to tell and we tell them because we're looking for mirrors a lot in our lives right we're looking to know that when we look out there's someone else looking back that can say hey that happened to me too or i share in this identity and here's what's worked for me in my healing so i hear that as a theme of the ways that we now are looking to other folks in our lives to say hey it's okay it, you know to um nydia's point you know that um, this wasn't your fault. Um, this is something you were handed. And so the theme here of sort of moving toward wholeness, moving toward belonging, moving toward community, as Tequila is talking about, um, reclaiming in all the ways that we are in these multitude of identities. Um, this is all an offering in a big way, right, for those folks that are here today to think about um, what you may be doing or want to be doing in your own racial trauma healing work. Um, so that you too can show up and be that adult that Andrea is talking about that shows up in the room and responds differently next time, right? Um, and so we have a reflection question for everyone that's here today. Um, it's on a slide that we can pull up, but you know, I'm curious in this kind of big tapestry, right? My mom's a weaver, so I think a lot about fibers, but in thinking about this as like a giant woven story between all of our lives, um, across the country what are threads in our narratives that you're picking up um, and how are they connected to your own story about your healing around your racial identity or your process that you might be in now so we're going to take about a minute and i'll 
watch the clock, but we're just going to take a moment to take a breath. Maybe you want to sip some water and just turn inward and notice what's come up as you've listened to us for the last 15 minutes and what might be some pieces of your own story that you want to continue to unearth and to work on for yourself. Take about 30 more seconds to tie it back into the beginning. Really notice the body in this too. It might be noticing that it's hard to gather thoughts, but you might be actually noticing sensations or emotions that you can also document that might be, you know, something to lead you into um, the thinking around this as well. Okay, so I think we're going to transition here. And I'm going to pass it off to, I believe, Tequila and Nydia. Thank you, Amelia. So, um, so yeah, we've heard, you know, quite a few you know, really strong stories, um, you know, specifically around our trauma. Um, and something that stands out to me is like when Andrea was sharing, you know, she shares that you know, she sees herself as as this um, crumpled piece of paper. Um, but, you know, in reality, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, belittle ourselves for our trauma, but really acknowledge the growth from it. So with this, um, <clears throat> with this, with that being said, I'd like to bring you to this concept or to this word um, called uh, chinachli. And the word chinachli, um, it's an, it's a indigenated word and it means um, germinating seed. And um, as we dive into our own healing journeys, um, it's important to think of ourselves as part of um, the earth and relate to every aspect of it. So um, we can think of the dirt um, as our trauma. And when we think of trauma, we think of it being associated with being buried or hidden or crumpled up and you know, just away from, uh, from sight. Um, but then we think of, of the seed, which is our inner child, that inner child that we're nurturing um, and really trying to, to, you know, sprout. And so when our inner child finally, um, you know, sprouts, like, uh, again, like Andrea had said, you know, where she's, she, after that meeting, she realized like, oh my gosh, I actually not said that. Or even um, in going back to her point in the educational system where um, she talked about the youth who didn't have that realization um, until like college so we think of that inner child sprouting and touching sunlight for the first time and thinking wow this is what healing is. this is my reclaiming of wholeness this is what it feels to heal and um you know really like soaking it in and um becoming that flower becoming that plant and um you know blooming uh, and being able to uh, really see the healing, but most importantly, feel it also. Feel it in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, and becoming one and knowing what are the next steps that our body needs to continue this healing. Um, so, you know, keeping that in mind when you get to start your own healing journey, um, or even, you know, just starting those steps to finding out what is what does healing mean to you and what is it going to look like in your future? Um, so with that being said, I'd like to pass it over to Tequila to get us uh, talking and to get us started with um, a couple more embodiment practices. So many, if not all of us, are gathered here today because we're really committed to wanting to see system change and transformation within the context of the institutions that we're working with. Right, we, we wanna see that change. We wanna see the ways in which we can dismantle white supremacy and how it's permeating the fabric of our society. 
And I want to connect that to why we're talking about healing. Why are we focusing in on this micro level part of racial healing? And part of what we believe at Radical Root Collective is that all of it is actually interconnected that we can't actually transform our systems until we transform ourselves. We can't actually heal our society until we heal ourselves. And that's why it's so important that we do this inner work of doing our own healing, building our own resiliency, because that is going to have the ripple effect, not only in our interpersonal relationships, but in our systems and our society as a whole. This slide borrows a quote from Adrian Marie Brown that really talks about this idea of fractals. Fractals is this idea that how we are at the small scale is how we are at the large scale, that the patterns of the universe repeat at scale. And so connecting that to what I'm saying is that what I'm doing on my internal level the healing work that I'm doing inside of myself to heal myself as a Black woman has a ripple effect in our society. It has a ripple effect in our community. That for you, as you're listening to the content of this training, as you think about the roles that you serve in your community, if you're an educator, the more that you can work on your own healing, the more that you can tap into your own racial healing, no matter what your racial identity is, that healing is going to have a ripple effect to the students that are in your classroom. If you're a doctor and you're focused on your own racial healing, that's going to have a ripple effect to your patients, to your system. So really thinking about the ways in which this internal vibration is going to vibrate to all that's what around us. And so rooting into small, really rooting first within ourselves is what we want to really encourage us to do. And connecting this to what we've been talking about around embodiment. Embodiment can be a really beautiful tool that you can always use in your own healing practice. Our bodies were designed to survive. Our bodies were designed to heal. Our bodies are always constantly trying to move toward healing. And so part of the reason why we've been inviting you to slow down during this training, why we've been inviting you to tap into those feelings, those sensations that you're feeling in your body, is because those can be clues to your healing journey. That can be clues to the pathway that you can take to really be on this journey of your own constant continued healing. And as we think more about like what this can look like on our own individual level, what this form of healing, what this form of embodiment can look like, um, it can be done in relationship to each other, in community with each other, or it can be done in our own personal individual spaces within ourselves. When we think about embodiment, when we think about slowing down in this way, I oftentimes think about it as respite for our nervous system. We're working in such fast paced environments. We're working in a society that's driven by capitalism. It's driven by labor. Things are so fast paced. Our nervous systems pick up on that and are oftentimes stuck in overdrive. So even giving yourself a minute two minutes to slow down, giving yourself a minute to just focus on breathing, a minute to focus on grounding yourself, gives your nervous system respite. It gives it respite so that you can then go right back into what you need to go back to doing, but you're going to go back into that from a much more grounded, connected place, which is going to also have that ripple effect. 
this is all really complex. It's ongoing and it's constant. Because white supremacy is so rampant and prevalent in our society, we want to be looking at our healing as also being ongoing and constant. We want you to be thinking about what are those daily practices that you can do? What are those weekly, monthly practices that you can do that's going to help to sustain you in your own healing journey so that you're really having that ripple effect that you desire? There's many different pathways to healing. And so embodiment is one pathway to healing, but we also wanna introduce another pathway to healing, which is about advocacy and finding your voice. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Andrea to share a little bit more about advocacy as a form of healing. Thank you, Tequila. So, now speaking on advocacy as a form of healing, I'd like to kind of personally share that I had always heard the word advocacy and I knew it was a good thing. I was like, oh, advocacy, yes, that's great. But um, I never really, I think, deeply understood the meaning. I could tell you the textbook definition, um, but I think I don't really um, kind of feel what it was like for me to be an advocate. Um, until um, I was diagnosed with my chronic illness. Um, and so I have um, endometriosis and PCOS, <clears throat> excuse me. And I was um, diagnosed fairly recently, um, but it took me about eight to 10 years to be diagnosed. And so for eight to 10 years, I lived with excruciating pain and kind of recalling what Nydia was speaking about, um, her uh, medical trauma. Um, me as a woman, um, I felt like I was uh, dismissed and also the Chicana. Um, I was dismissed. I was told that, you know, the pain was normal or that the pain was in my head, that I was seeking attention, that I couldn't afford the help that I needed to see the specialist that I needed to see. Um, and so I had to, I guess, really learn how to speak up for myself um, in order to receive the diagnosis, in order to receive help so that I wouldn't be living the way that I was living before with like uh, excruciating pain. Um, and so I'd like to name that advocacy is like such a powerful tool and we can all become agents of change and advocates for social change. But I'd also like to emphasize that it's important to find the balance. Um, so there should be the right amount of like pushing and fighting while maintaining your own well-being. Um, and I can I personally say that I think it's exhausting to always kind of be pushing and fighting. And so it's important to find that balance. Um, and we can suggest shifts in uh, structures and policies that are failing our use, like racial profiling. We can empower individuals to experience ownership of behavior, um, have self-regulating uh, strategies, kind of like Tequila was speaking on, breathing, grounding, mindfulness education, bring, um, bringing awareness, um, shifting perspectives also. And uh, as the name suggests of our webinar, uh, nurturing resiliency and promoting healing. Um, and so um, at adults working with youth can support youth and building capacity for self-advocacy and validate their experiences and feelings. And youth can recognize resiliency in the face of trauma and um, I guess really, really learn what advocacy can mean for you, um, whether you're um, an adult or you are youth, and just showing your community, showing everyone what you're capable of. And so with that said, I'd like to invite you um, to another embodiment practice. And so as we've now, I think, um, shared so much information with you, I'd like to invite you all to just take a, a quick deep breath with me. And so we're just gonna inhale in and exhale. And so now we're gonna focus on our bodies. And if it helps you to ground yourself, um, feel around what's around you. Maybe you're feeling the armrest in your chair. Maybe you're feeling the, the ground below you, carpet, tile. Maybe you're feeling the desk. And so really focus on your body. And as you think about advocacy and resiliency and healing, 
Um, where do you feel it in your body? Do you feel it in your mind? Are thoughts just flowing in your mind? Are you feeling it in your heart? Is your heart pounding as you're thinking about ways that you can become an advocate? Are you feeling it in your arms, in your hands, in your legs, in your feet? Just take a second to recognize your body and where you're feeling this energy flow within you. And you're going to let that power kind of guide you in your thoughts and your feelings and into what next steps can look like for you, into what advocacy can look like for you, into what your healing journey can look like for you. I know that you can always practice this again on your own. Take a breath to recognize your environment, recognize your body, your feelings, your sensations, as you've done within our self-reflections. And remember to always focus on your body and your energy. Um, and you can always take another breath if needed. And thank you all for participating. I hope that you felt it somewhere. I felt it in my heart. I felt my heart pounding thinking about everyone participating in this and just feeling their bodies and feeling their energy flow. Um, and so if I could get the next slide, please. I hope you keep this power and energy with you as you come back, but we are gonna open up the Q&A now. And so if you would like to um, type in questions, either in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we will review and answer. And we can continue to pause for another moment. And if there's other questions that folks want to put into the chat, we can um, answer them. Um, and then we'll maybe pause for another minute. If there's no questions, we can continue. We also appreciate the chat affirmations or comments. We can offer a little bit of space for those as well. If folks have something to share, we'll hold it for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martha, for your question. I'll, I'll jump in because I think in the skin that I'm in, um, there's a, and it's not exclusive to young people, but in when I think about young, it's not exclusive to white young people, but when I think about that comment, it seeds into a deep seated fear I have in the young person that I'm currently raising in their white body to have come home and say, I don't have a culture, what do I do, right? And I think as a white person, part of what I have learned is my strategy is what I mentioned before, which is recovering connection to a family lineage that is in its wholeness, right? To actually think about culture in um, a way that I can claim the culture of resistance, the culture of um, solidarity across lines of race and examples in history of that being uh, a thing that always was, right? And so I think of Anne Braden, who was a white racial justice activist in the 50s and 60s, who would go into white neighborhoods and she would help um, black couples buy houses and like in, under her name and then pass the title off. She was uh, went deep into the South and did deep unlearning work with other white folks in the South. And so those are examples that I hope to offer my young people who identify as white to counterbalance this idea that we memorialize the you know male war leaders who committed genocide, but no, actually, who we should be looking to are the Ann Bradens, the Jim Browns. Um, 
And so that's what a piece for me in the skin I'm in when I think about working with white, white youth in particular is encouraging them to claim the history of resistance that is part of our legacy as well as the atrocities. Um, that's one strategy I would name. I would also add that we are not taught about the history of race and how race is a social construct and the creation of whiteness. And so even for young folks to be able to have access to the truth of our history in a way that isn't how we typically learn about it in our K through 12 educational system. Um, helping young folks, particularly young white folks to be able to to like understand, even as Joe was describing in her own journey, like who are you? Who was your family history and lineage before you became white? What are the ethnic identifications that are a part of your lineage? What are the cultural practices that are unique and specific to that? Um, and I, that's some of what I've been kind of like learning and reflecting on, but even as a black child growing up, just realizing how little I learned about history history um, within the context of our educational system. Right. Shall we, if there's more questions that folks want to put into the chat, feel free, but perhaps we can just continue to move on with our last slides um, and then we can loop back if needed. Does that feel good, panelists? So we wanted to share in terms of the next steps that we have spent intentionally a lot of time today during the webinar wanting to share with you parts of our narrative, wanting to give you some examples of what does healing look like within the context of the skin that each of us live in. But we also want to provide you with facilitated space to be able to go through your own reflection process. And so if you are interested, we are going to be having three follow-up racial affinity groups for folks to register and participate in that will provide you with space to be able to do your own deepening and reflection around the material that we talked about today. This space will be very much rooted in exploring more internalized and interpersonal aspects of what we talked about. And so if you're interested in doing that level of work, we'd love to have you come. We're going to have three groups that are identity rooted. And so we will have one group that is for folks that identify as multiracial or mixed. That will be facilitated by Amelia on March 29th from 11 to 1 PST. We'll be having a group on the 21st from 9.30 to 11.30 for folks that identify under the BIPOC umbrella, so Black, Indigenous, and or people of color. Um, that will be facilitated by myself, Andrea, and Nydia. And we will also be having a group on March 22nd from 3 to 5 PST for folks that identify as white that will be facilitated by Joe. We will, um, CSHA will be giving you more information about how to register, but we look forward to continuing to deepen with you all through the course of the affinity groups. The affinity groups will be meeting style, and so you will be able to see and connect with other folks live time through the process. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nidia for closing. Thank you so much for those next steps, um, Tequila. And also um, thank you uh, for Andrea for closing us out with that embodiment practice. I know this sounds like very, you know, um, obvious, but like, I love breathing. Um, and, but I, you know, I really love doing that intentional breathing of like, you know, you're, you're taking a step back and you're not, you're not breathing like normal, you know, of course to like live, but you're taking a step back and really, focusing on what's giving you actual life which is of course your breath so I really love enjoy I, I really enjoyed um, doing that so thank you Andrea and also thank you to um, Joe and Amelia for um, being vulnerable in this space and um, thank you to the audience for allowing us to um, share our insight and uh, share what we have um, and you know of course, these next steps hopefully you know as we dive deep into these like affinity groups um, that we get to um, 
interact a little bit more, really dive deep um, into our healing journeys and into, you know, that reclaiming wholeness. So uh, thank you all. And with that, I will be handing it over to CDC Chief to close us out. Thank you so much to everyone from Radical Root, Tequila, Joe, and Amelia, and our youth board members, Nidia and Andrea, has um, brought so much of yourselves today and just really appreciate um, all the content and the energy um, and the heart that you um, shared. You know, I will be sitting with a lot today. Um, and as everyone mentioned um, about the next steps, we you will be getting a follow-up email um, from CSHA. And in that email will be links to register for the affinity group um, that aligns with your um, identity, how you identify. Um, so look out for that email. Um, and if you wanna um, dive further with these wonderful facilitators, please sign up. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, we'll be signing off. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Great to be here. Thanks. Mm -hmm.